The Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 8, verses 4 through 20, and chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for, appoint for us, then, a king to govern us, like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me for being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all, of, all the words that the Lord <clears throat> to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his quarters. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkey and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, No, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we, will, that we also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Technically, this is the lectionary from last week. Um, we're going to kind of be a week behind for a couple of weeks because we're going to spend a couple of weeks talking about the rise of the kings. And throughout the summer, the lectionary calls for us to hear about the kings. Um, specifically, David eventually will get there. And so that will be a... Something to look forward to, I guess. I don't know how to say that. Um, so sometimes when we're, um, we're hearing a story from the Old Testament, it can help us to place it on a timeline. Because there are like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of a timeline. So um, a good place to start, I, I, I find, is not in the beginning, because that's very, very, very long ago. So Egypt is a great place to start. So the Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt and a guy named Moses comes to free them. And Moses is the mouthpiece for a god named Yahweh, who the people at this point don't remember, though their ancestors knew him. And Moses, in the great act of the Exodus rite, they leave Egypt, they cross the Reed Sea, and then they wander, they wander in the wilderness for a few generations, and then they settle in the Promised Land. And at this point, they stop being a nomadic people, and they've started a little civilization, and, you know, as things come up and as there's issues, somebody has a, a dispute with a neighbor, right? How, how do they settle that? 
Well, they go to uh, what is called one of the judges. Okay, so there's a group of judges that decide kind of what's just and what's not. But really what they're doing is they're there to interpret the will of God. They're the ones who are supposed to keep God at the center of everything. So, so uh, they would say, okay, what does Torah say? What does the law say? Right? And then they would help interpret this, and then they would make a ruling. The judges had regular day-to-day things to do. This was just kind of something that they had to do whenever an issue or dispute rose. And I'm telling you this because this is right where our story starts, right here in the time of the judges. Up to this point, Israel does not yet have a king. They will by the end of our text today, right? So a group of elders come to Samuel, who is a judge. Samuel's one of the judges, and they say, we want a king. And Samuel's pretty offended. And so he prays to God, and God goes, you know, Samuel, this isn't really about you. They don't have a problem with your leadership as a judge. This is about me. They've decided they want to put somebody in front of their lives. It's somebody at the center of their lives. It's not me. But God says, go ahead. Let him have, let him have a king. But you have to tell them what's going to happen if they choose to get a king. The king will take your sons, and he will make them plow fields, and he will make them make the instruments of war. And he will send your sons into battle, and some of them may die. And he will take your daughters, and he will make them bakers and cookers, and have them make oil for the king. And he's going to take all of the good land, all of the really good land of the nation, and give it to the most privileged, the people that he wants to give it to. And then he's going to take 10% of everything, 10% of your grain, 10% of your cattle, 10% of your land, 10% of everything, to do as he so chooses. And this is where we come to our text today. And they, they get that king. The first king's name is Saul. So there's a lot in today's text. We're just going to kind of work our way through it here. I think that the first and most important thing to address in today's scripture is that Israel's main reason for wanting a king to rule over them was because other nations had one. This group of people, they were supposed to be set apart, right? They were supposed to be different. They had this special relationship with God, and they were going to live into that relationship. But now they're, they're sitting there like, you know, well, everybody else has a king. Why can't we have a king? I can just hear God saying, Well, if the Canaanites went and jumped off of a bridge, would you jump off of a bridge, Israel, you know? Um, I mean, what drove them to that place? Did did they think that they lacked security? Yeah, that makes sense. I often find myself thinking that, um, that I need the things that my neighbor has in order to be secure. I want an equally good home or car to be able to provide safety for my child. Or um, I want... Uh, a better cell phone so that I can stay in touch with my loved ones better. But these aren't things I really need, need, right? These are just things that I kind of want. Israel didn't need a king. They just kind of spent their time looking at their neighbors. And this story, it kind of begs this question about what does it mean when we put our own wants and our own needs above that of God's, right? Right? God told them that they didn't really want or need a king, that it would only lead to bad things. But the people just put their own wants or needs kind of ahead of God's anyway. And this, this, my beloved, this is a problem. This is a big problem. This is one of those problems that will inevitably tumble into more and more problems. When our wants are put ahead of God's, it results in a broken relationship. We begin to think that we have the right to call all of the shots, that we're the one in charge. It goes like this. Um, God says, I think that what's really best for you is to do X, Y, and Z, and I love you, and I promise I'm doing what's right and what's best for you. Please trust me. And we go, well, um, I mean, I hear you, God. But I really was thinking about doing this kind of in this other way. I mean, it's kind of the same thing, right? But it's just a little bit more with my influence. And I just 
kind of really don't want to, and, and I disagree with you. I am right now in this moment having flashbacks of conversations between me and my mother when I was a teenager. <laughs> like, well, I mean, I hear you, but, you know, this, and this inability to kind, of, to kind of put trust into the parent, right, or to the authority, this inability, it puts a strain on our relationships, right? And that's what happened to Israel and God. It puts this strain on the relationship, and the trust between the two sides just begins to break. And God tries to warn them what's going to happen if they get a king. I'm going to read these words again. These are hard words to read, and they're hard words to hear, hear but... I think that we can relate. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots, and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you've chosen for yourselves. See, the rise of the kings brings with it a rise to an abuse of power that had never yet been seen within the Israelite community. It might be something that sounds familiar to us, but this is brand new for them. Because when the relationship of God with God and the people, when that's not healthy anymore, abuse is more likely to take place, right? And when one person or a few people get most of the power, that abuse, the risk for abuse is greater. The judges, I mean, they were just this group of folk that were kind of called on in times of distress. They weren't like kings at all. But the kings, as we see from this point on, they make huge mistakes. They will bring monumentous suffering onto the people, often by forgetting that God is in charge. Because they have so much power that they kind of confuse their own role with God. And I, I think almost we need to say that this is expected, that this is part of human nature. I don't think we can even put all of the blame then on to the kings. It's when the people have allowed the kings to have that much power that they're going to inevitably confuse that relationship. It's just how power works. And this is why at the beginning of our text, God says that their request for a king is really them speaking against God. All of this means that someone now is going to have to handle this situation. Someone is going to have to say something. There is going to be an unbalanced power issue. There's the broken relationship now. If this is how it's going to be from now on, whenever there's a king, right, who's going to handle this? The people want a king. God says, fine. But people, you get something else too. You get a prophet. The rise of the first king marks the rise of the first prophet. This first prophet is Samuel. And our text today is a prophetic order, oracle. Samuel was the last judge. Samuel is now the first prophet. The role of the prophet, the role of the prophet is to call out the king and the people when they forget that God is in charge. And there will be a prophet for every single king. There is always a prophet when there is a king. The idea, we've already talked about it, the, God, the idea is that God is supposed to remain at the center, the center of everything for these people, all right? The center of their choices, their lives, where they eat, how their relationships work, everything. God is supposed to stay right there. And when the people, especially people with power and privilege, forget to keep God at the center, as Samuel so clearly expresses that they will, then it's the role of the prophet to be the voice of God and to speak the difficult truth that no one wants to hear. 
So we're going to take a moment to talk about a difficult truth. I am privileged because I am white. That can be a difficult truth sometimes. And the obviousness of it comes in my face all of the time. So I'm just going to share one from last night that was a moment of joy. A friend of mine posted on Facebook about a friend of hers, a sorority sister of hers, who just graduated with a doctorate. She graduated from a theological seminary, and she studied um, F. It's, I can't even pronounce it. It's like when you study music and ethnicity with theology in the middle. And she uh, this is a beautiful black woman. She's a professor now. And um, she is the first black female to get a doctorate in this field. You know what it's like to be the first something? Like, you can't be the first white male to do anything anymore. Like, that's been done, right? Like, the first black women that, that earned a theological degree from a seminary happened in my lifetime. Maybe, maybe 20 years before I was born, maybe it was the earliest. There's, like, less than 100 of them ever in human history. When you go to the seminary libraries and you're like, I'm going to find a book by a black scholar. Oh, there they are. There's the shelf, that big. That's privilege, right? And sometimes, sometimes hearing and seeing that truth is really, really hard and really heartbreaking. And I don't know what to do with it sometimes. And sometimes it's debilitating. And sometimes there's feelings of shame. And I have to deal with processing all of that, right? But, but when I hear and I see those things, I, I believe that what I'm hearing and seeing is the prophetic voice, the prophetic witness calling me to my privilege and reminding me about what needs to remain at the center of my life and who defines those morals and those ethics and those values and what it means to be in relationship with God and God's people. And then, with that perspective, how am I called to respond? I feel like I hear the voice of prophets every day. I see a prophetic voice. I see a prophetic voice in people holding cell phone cameras while guns are pulled on unarmed teenagers. I hear and see a prophetic voice in the cops I know in the city that are doing a good job. I hear and see prophetic voices leading the next generation and learning how to do nonviolent protests for movements that matter. I, I hear prophets speaking up for the oppressed. I see it in our church and in our churches and in our neighborhoods and our communities and our schools, in all walks of life, in every occupation. They're around. They're there. It's alive. And I know that because, because when the kings of this world, when they choose to tie their corporate interests into their reign, when there are sweatshops filled with our daughters who are making oils and graveyards filled with our sons who fought wars over natural resources, when we live on a land that was taken from the people who were first here, and when our tax money is spent arming our soldiers and our police forces instead of our schools and our parks, God does not remain quiet. God finds a way to speak. It's unpopular and it's not pretty. It's often a difficult conversation, but it is prophetic. Because when we, the people, and especially the people with power, when we forget who we are, and more importantly, whose we are, when we abuse power and our relationship with God is broken, what is God then to do? I know this seems like a really dark message. I know. But it's not. It's quite the opposite. See, even when we appoint people and they are given or they take too much power, even when we forget to love our neighbor, even when we treat certain bodies with more lives and care than others, even when the minister sounds like she doesn't know that she's equally as guilty at all of these things, even when we covet other nations, what other nations have, even when we are convinced that our ideas are better than what God would suggest in all of this, even when we forget to keep God at the center, God remains with us. And that is hopeful. God does not leave. God does not stop speaking. God uses a prophetic voice and action to come to us, to call us, and to call us out. 
God says, your kings and your will for a king are not my king, nor are they my will. For a king cannot love us as God loves us. A king cannot take care of our family like God can take care of our family. And God remains with us, so our hope remains also. It is an understanding, it is an understanding the kings of Israel and really getting our mind around that, that we begin to see the radical difference of Jesus Christ as our king. And really, Jesus was more of the prophetic tradition anyway. When you hear about the kingship of Christ, you have a comparison, not only today, but also in the scripture. As members of the body of Christ, we are called to worship only one king. He does not sit in the White House. He does not sit at the head of a boardroom table. He does not work from a place of scarcity, and he does not use violence to make his point or to gain a following. We're called to do something different and to be a part of that hope for the world in whatever walk of life you come from. Good Lord, show us the way. Show us together how we may be prophetic. Amen. Whew. For our time of reflection today, I'm going to do this too. I want us to take an honest assessment and consider the ways in which we are more like a king than the ways in which we are more like a prophet. If you are like me, the list on the left will be larger, the king list. The ways that you are more like the king and the ways that you are more like the prophet. If there's paper in your pews, you can jot it down, or if you just want to think about it, let it sit on your heart. And after you've done your little assessment, I just ask you to pray silently, asking God to better clarify what word you are to give in this community and in this world.